Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation, the very nice uh, workshop. It's been nice to hear about very different topics um, and to have different communities in the one same place today. Um, and so yeah, today, so I, I come from Richie Flows, Einstein Metrics, uh, but I'm going to talk about some uh, remarks on scalar curvature, mass for weighted manifolds, and and our main motivation was Ricci flow, but obviously it's got some links with uh, general relativity as well. And this is joint work with Alex Doriel in Paris and uh, Julius Baldoff, who's in the back of the room. Uh, and um, so Julius is really the expert on spin geometry of this project, uh, if you have specific questions. Uh, um, okay, so this is, this is, there are four papers. The last one is coming in the next weeks, uh, but I'll try to to walk you through uh, what are the main results. So, um, so yeah, the, the words in the title were weighted manifolds, Ricci flows. So let's take a moment to understand this. So weighted Riemannian manifold for me is, uh, or manifold with density, depending on who you are, you might use uh, one name or the other, is a Riemannian manifold together with a volume form, which is not exactly that of the Riemannian, uh, which is not the Riemannian volume, but has some density, which would be this e to the minus f where f is just a smooth function for us. Uh, so they appear naturally as limits of collapsing. So in the, in the theory of lower bounds on Ricci curvature, for instance, you, in the limit, you cannot, I mean, the natural measure is not the Riemannian measure, but may have some uh, density. And similarly in physics, I think that they appear in theories um, where you have scalar fields, where you have some dimensionally uh, reduced uh, uh, theory in a larger dimension space. Um, so this was first studied by Lishnovich, but made much more popular by uh, Bakri Emery. They used it a lot in analysis in, um, in um, probability theory as well. And Bakri and Emery are mostly known for introducing this weighted Ricci curvature. So when you have a weighted Riemannian manifold, the natural thing that plays the role of Ricci curvature is not the usual Ricci curvature, but you need to add this Hessian of F term. And this was necessary, a necessary definition to even talk about uh, the synthetic uh, theory of lower bounds on Ricci. So all, all of the RCD spaces uh, theory can only work if you uh, take this uh, more general definition of Ricci character. Now, today, I want to motivate um, to go back to Perman's papers where he introduces a weighted scalar curvature and, and in, Interestingly, it's not been um, studied that much as a, as a weighted scalar curvature, and that's what we try to do here. And this is not, you'll notice that this is not the trace of uh, Bakri Emery's curvature. It's a bit different, but it really seems to be the right one. Uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of very clean formulas that completely extend the unweighted ones to the weighted case by, with this formula only, and it would not work with another one. So I really want to motivate that this is the right weighted scalar curvature. And if you want to maybe you know, have a synthetic theory of scalar curvature, maybe you will need uh, to, to have this notion of weighted scalar curvature somewhere. Okay, and so the main motivation for everything here was Ricci flow. Ricci flow is this curve of metrics that uh, satisfy the, the uh, almost parabolic equation. So we'll, we've seen some links, uh, I mean, we'll see links of a Ricci flow and scalar curvature in, in Robin's talks, in Pollock's talks as well. Uh, so there is definitely a link with scalar curvature. And, but it's also been uh, used, it's been uh, central in geometry and, and topology. And here I just give some of the main results we've had through Ricci flows. And you'll notice that everything happens in dimension three or in higher dimension with positive, positive curvature or some very strong positivity assumption on the curvature. And well, the question is, can we say anything without such assumptions in, high, in dimension four, say, without uh, a very strong positivity assumption on the curvature? And the main difficulty is that, well, we don't even know that much about Einstein four manifolds. Uh, so, and there are the fixed points of Ricci flows. If you don't understand the fixed points, you can't understand the flow. So uh, what happens in for Einstein four manifolds? So Einstein three manifolds are just uh, uh, just have constant scalar curvature, they are very easy to deal with, but in dimension four, something new happens uh, on, already for Einstein metrics, and they can degenerate to singular spaces called Einstein orbifolds, 
but here we will focus on the singularity models because these orbifold singularities appear by bubbling out some Ricci flat Ailey metrics. And we want to understand these singularity models through Ricci flows uh, because they will also be uh, singularities for Ricci flows because uh, Ricci flow is just a generalization of Einstein form manifolds. So a Ricci flat Ailey metric, I'll be more precise about my assumptions on the decay later, is Ricci flat, of course, and it's ALE in the sense that it's asymptotic to a quotient of Euclidean space. The simplest example is the Aguchi Hanson metric found in 79, and it's Ricci flat and asymptotic to just the quotient of Euclidean space by antipolar identification. So that's your asymptotic cone. So one thing you can do from a Ricci flat metric is rescale it by a small factor t. It stays Ricci flat because it's scale invariant, and you can let this parameter t go to zero. And by definition, just definition of the asymptotic cone, you converge to the asymptotic cone um, in a metric sense, in a, in a pointed Gromov-Hausdorff sense, if you want. And well, what happens here is that you created a singularity, and that's your orbifold singularity. And all of these singularities appear that way along, um, I mean, along the curve of Einstein metrics or uh, along a Ricci flow. Uh, indeed, it's been proven by uh, Bamler Zhang. Uh, Simon and Bamler in different settings that uh, rich, limits of uh, Ricci flows can have orbifold singularities and uh, at least with boundless scalar curvature, the way they appear is really through uh, Ricci flat Ailey metrics. And it's been actually uh, obtained explicitly by Appleton and in a different way uh, by Brandler Capuleas, which is a very different construction, but still you have a sequence of, uh, you have a Ricci flow that exhibit such, uh, such a generation, but at time minus infinity. So it's a bit different. Um, but so in the Einstein setting, um, I was able during my PhD thesis to reconstruct every single uh, possible desingularization, every single uh, degeneration of Einstein metrics. I reconstructed it by a gluing perturbation procedure. And uh, you know, something that, and, and it was very useful. We could uh, rule out some behaviors from it. And well, can we do something like that for Ricci flows? Well, that would be amazing. But one thing that's needed in, in the flow setting and not in the static setting is that you need the stability of your singularity models to even try and do this thing. So that's the first part of the talk. With Alex, we try to understand the stability of Ricci flat Ailey metrics with the long-term goal to understand uh, uh, these uh, singularity formations. Um, so Sorry, before- when you say this, are you, are you talking about taking singularity models and constructing examples that have those singularity models? Or are you talking about taking general stuff and, and, and so, not seeing what singularity I mean, if we, if we are able to really mimic what happened in the, rich, in the, the Einstein case, uh, every single degeneration that gives uh, an orbifold singularity should be reconstructed, uh, should be possible to reconstruct by gluing in the singularity model to the orbifold and-, and uh, So that's the type of, type of results you're talking Yeah, but that's, I mean, that, that would be, uh, I mean, that's a very long-term goal, uh, but it but worked. done it for certain examples. It worked for Einstein metrics. And now, what about Ricci flows? Maybe, maybe there is a way to do something like this. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different question, but it's, uh, that would be you know, the, the long-term goal. Um, yeah, and so we, we need to understand the stability of uh, Ricci flat Ailey metrics. And, and if you look at all of the recent papers on, um, Einstein, on, on Ricci flows, the stability of um, singular Ricci yeah. models are very important if you look at Daimler yeah. Kleiner's work, for instance. And um, so, so okay, was... okay, <laughs> um, yeah. And so, so yeah. What what is known about these Ricci flat Ailey metrics? So unfortunately, they are not classified even in a mentioned four. And the only known examples are hyperkeller or their quotients. Um, is they've been um, classified by Kronheimer and Suvaina. And in higher dimensions, there are examples which also have reduced holonomy. And well, our big question is, I mean, for Ricci flow would be, or is any Ricci flat Ailey metric stable? Because all of these are stable. And I sh you should note that this is not true for asymptotically flat and asymptotically locally flat, where Schwarzschild, the Ricci flat Schwarzschild is a counterexample. The Ricci flat top bolt metric is a counterexample. OK. So what do we even mean by stability? There are a lot of notions of stability. I just want to present three of them. So they all come from uh, looking at the Ricci curvature, minus two Ricci, which is uh, the direction in which you're moving along Ricci flow. 
And if you develop this close to a Ricci flat metric, the first term you obtain is a, a Lichnerovich Laplacian. That's some gauge terms we won't uh, care about. Uh, but the, the Lichnerovich Laplacian has this very nice form. It's a rough Laplacian plus some curvature term, some zeroth order term. And we will have different notions of stability from just this observation. So the first one is the linear stability. So say that you move in the direction of um, H and say that H is, is mo moving that way. You, you want to say that you are stable if you tend to flow back to a Ricci flat metric. So that would make you, you know, go that way. And, and you, can, uh, you can measure that by taking the dot product of your variation and, and the first uh, step you move towards and, and, and the right linear condition is that one. You want your eigenvalues to have the right sign for this operator. And what you're saying is really, I move towards H, what makes me uh, flow back to, to a Ricci flat metric. And that's actually the dynamical stability. So that's the one we would probably care the most about. Uh, if, you if you start at a perturbation of a Ricci flat metric, you're dynamically stable if you flow back to a Ricci flat metric in infinite time. And there is a last notion of stability, which is probably uh, more linked to, to this uh, workshop, which is Kelo curvature rigidity, saying that a Ricci flat metric is stable if whenever you have a metric of positive scalar curvature, uh, non-negative scalar curvature close by, then it has to be a Ricci flat. So it's a very strong rigidity statement. It's true for K3, it's true for everyone. Uh, we'll see every one of um, Kronheimer's examples with uh, DK assumptions. And uh, it's true for the torus. Um, and so it's very linked to uh, obstructions to having um, positive scalar curvature metrics on a manifold. Okay, so uh, let me introduce this one uh, functional lambda ALE, which uh, will be the core of understanding the stability of Ricci flat ALE metrics, and then I'll link it to, to mass. Okay, so the basic question was well, before even talking about stability, um, can we, can we, how can we detect Ricci flat metrics and how can we, uh, and, and the way you do it will, will tell us also how to, 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 to see when they are stable. So the, the classical way, uh, which is more than a century old, is to, to say that Ricci flat metrics are the critical points of uh, Hilbert Einstein functional, what well, they are. Uh, but a more modern way to do it is to say that there are critical points of permanence lambda functional on compact manifolds. Uh, so this functional is obviously very linked to Ricci flow. Uh, Ricci flow is its gradient flow, and so it's non-decreasing along Ricci flow. And so in some sense, if you start at a, at a, at a given lambda, then you're imp improving it along the flow. So we will uh, focus on, on this one and, and talk about um, a result in the compact case, we'll try, which we'll try to mimic in the AAD case. So the, this, is, this has you know, a bit of a long history. Uh, it's done by Sesam, who didn't work with the lambda functional, but she's the first who, who worked on uh, the stability of Ricci flat metrics and had a, a result about this. But then Hasselhofer reproved her result, and Hasselhofer and Buzano uh, proved it in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in all generality. Uh, and so to, def to, to make sense of this, let's define a manifold as uh, lambda stable if any nearby metric in a C2 sense uh, is, uh, has um, a lower lambda functional. So lambda, the lambda functional of, of, of our metric is a, is a local maximizer uh, in some topology. Well, for compact Ricci flat uh, metrics, you have a very nice characterization that the dynamical stability is equivalent to being such a local maximizer of lambda. So this is really the most, the best you can expect. That's a, a really beautiful result. And if you want to talk about st linear stability, you need to add the assumption of integrability, meaning that if you have an infinitesimal rich flat deformation, you actually have a whole curve uh, starting with this infinitesimal deformation uh, direction. And there is also a third one, which was not stated in this, uh, which is well known. It's not been stated in all of these papers. And I think that the survey of Dahl and Conker is probably the best place to, to see that, where they say that scalar curvature rigidity is equivalent to lambda stability as well. And well, our naive question is, how can we extend this to the ALE setting? Oh, because lambda is increasing along the flow. So, um, okay, so say so you have, um, Okay, so, 
say we have um, G here, we have lambda here. And <clears throat> so if you're a maximizer uh, of, of lambda, then Ricci flow will, is, uh, lambda increases along Ricci flow. So it will typically you know, flow back to, it, it will try to, to reach a maximizer. On the other hand, if you have, if you're not a maximizer and you start a Ricci flow here and you were looking at this one metric, it will flow away. It cannot go back to a metric with lower lambda. It will, can never, because lambda increases along the flow, it can never go back to a lower lambda metric. Yeah, so, no, it's not, a, a, it's the same sign. So, um, I mean, it depends what's your convention. My convention for Hilbert Einstein is this one. Right, uh, but it depends in which direction you're moving. And so Hilbert Einstein has the problem that it has the conformal direction and the traceless transverse part. Uh, Perman's functional doesn't have the problem of conformal deformations. And that's also one thing we'll try to, to explain uh, during the talk, that we don't want conformal deformations because they change the geometry drastically. We'll instead add a density to our manifolds. Question. So you don't need, um Strict stability? Um, no. Um, no, because you will have, typically, you will have, for every rich flat metric I know, there are rich flat deformations. So all of the nearby rich flat metrics will have lambda equals zero. That's what I'm saying. So you're not, if they're nearby ones, why would you flow back to the same? Oh, one? you won't flow back to the same oh, one. You'll flow back to. Part of stability, but, uh, yeah, so you'll flow back to uh, some. Some nearby, yeah, I don't know if I, maybe I stated it wrong, uh, but you flow back to a nearby rich flat metric. You're, you're right, that's not the same one, necessarily. But, um, and so what does scalar curvature rigidity mean in this context? Uh, so it means that if you have um, a, a, a perturbation of your rich flat metric with non-negative scalar curvature, then it's rich flat. Okay. Okay, so that's what happens in the compact setting so let's look at the non-compact setting, the ALE setting, and we'll assume that it's of order tau. And by order tau, I mean that the decay of the metric towards the Euclidean one is this, just R minus tau, you have the same, the usual decay for the derivatives. We've already seen it a few times this week. Um, and this lets us also define the space of CL tau metrics for which uh, all of the derivatives less than L decay uh, in the same way. And I want to add something about the threshold for this tau, uh, which is the typical one in, in mass questions. Um, so we will have in our, we will be inter integrating uh, scalar curvature uh, and things like this. And the, the nonlinear terms will be like this, and we want them to be integrable. Uh, otherwise your nonlinear terms are larger than your linear terms and you can't say anything through perturbative arguments. And so we'll assume that tau is at, mo at least uh, and minus two divided by two, very typical uh, of um, math questions. But maybe a bit differently, we will also uh, have this other threshold uh, n minus two, and I'll explain that just in the next slide. So we'll always assume that tau is between n minus two divided by two and n minus two. Obviously the, uh, the upper bound is not restricted if you decay faster then you decay slower, but uh, a lot of our statements would not be true with uh, tau larger than n minus two. Okay, so let me talk about the, some difficulties of the non-compact case. So the first thing is that the linearization uh, doesn't have a, uh, uh, an isolated, uh, minus zero is not isolated in the spectrum, meaning that you will never have exponential convergence back to Ricci flat metrics. You will not have your optimal exponent in your way of rich inequalities, et cetera. And so this a problem, this uh, makes uh, stability much harder to detect. Another problem is that um, it's also typical in mass questions, but you need to work with weighted spaces because your linearization, your Laplacian is not Fredholm in, in the usual um, holder or Sobolev spaces. So you need to work with weighted spaces every time, all the time. Another problem is that Ricci flow will not, will not preserve something that with tau larger than n minus two. So that's why we assume that tau is less than n minus two all the time. And that creates some problems. One of them being that we'll have a lot of boundary terms appearing every time we do an integration by parts. Um, that will make some formulas uh, a bit more complicated, but that's all we can assume. And assuming that this uh, was, I mean, at the time it was not known, but Diane Ma 
thought that they could have a, a notion of uniform convergence and link it to, to math questions. And it actually never happens. You never have uniform convergence in their sense. It's all already been, uh, not said, but noticed uh, by Yuli in, in uh, 2018. So yeah, the, the, what the convergence which were expected in 2004 just don't happen. So we, we need to, to deal with a bit more, um, so, something a bit weaker. Um, something else is that whenever you are in the two situations you care about, so if you care about mass, you probably care about this situation. If you care about stability, you probably care about being close to a richly flat heliometric. In both situations, Fermi's lambda functional is just zero all the time. It doesn't detect any richly flat metric. It doesn't detect anything. Uh, it will always be zero, whatever your geometry is, because the test function can just flow to infinity. I'll be more precise about what is lambda functional. But still, Yuli was able to prove a positive mass theorem in dimension three through Ricci flow. So we want to understand why this works. Okay, so we've seen that in the compact case, everything worked out very well with the lambda functional. So can we have a non-compact lambda functional that actually works? Well, there was an idea of Hasselhofer um, a few years ago, which was to, instead of, uh, so I realized that I didn't define, yeah, no, I defined a lambda functional, sorry. Uh, but remember, in the uh, lambda functional here, you were taking the infimum over uh, phi <coughs> such that uh, the, the integral of phi squared is equal to one. That was your, uh, that was the, the set of functions you were minimizing on. Here, Hasselhofer minimizes over functions that tend to one at infinity. It's a different normalization, but it makes the, the functional uh, well-defined at least when scalar curvature is not negative or when you're close to an ALE Ricci flat metric, as long as scalar curvature is integrable, which is typic a typical assumption when you're doing uh, um, general relativity. And moreover, there exists a minimizer. I just define it for notation purpose. So I call it phi G and the minimizer in, in F here will be F G. Whenever you see it, that's what I mean. And so you have the equality, uh, sorry, yeah, there shouldn't be any infimum here. That's just an equality here. That's your infimum attained at phi g. That's what you get. So this is nice, but not nice enough. Uh, the problem is that having scalar curvature in L1 is a bad condition. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's a bad condition. Uh, it's not closed in, in your topology. So you cannot do uh, analysis on this kind of set. You cannot. You, it, it will not be a closed condition. The L1 norm of scalar curvature is not continuous in your topology, and uh, therefore uh, his functional will not be continuous in this topology. Sorry, can I? Yeah. Go back to the slide to see the definition of this. Yeah. So am I right? So I guess if if it's scalar flat, as long as it's zero. Yeah, gives you zero. Yeah. Yeah, and scalar flat will be. Uh, a case of, uh, of interest, yep. So yeah, when, when, phi, when scalar curvature is zero, then the minimizer is just phi equals one or f equals zero, and the functional will just be zero. But the, the actual good functional will not be zero because the actual good functional is to take the difference of this functional introduced by uh, Hasselhofer and subtract mass. I'll give the definition uh, a bit later, but you, you, we've already seen it uh, 10 times this week. Um, but subtracting mass to this functional makes it much, much better behaved. Um, and so in particular, uh, the, in, in the other case, we were only defined when uh, scalar curvature was in L1. This time, it's always defined in a C2 alpha neighborhood, even when mass is not defined, even when this uh, functional here is not defined. So we can make this uh, functional, I mean, it makes sense in the whole neighborhood, it extends to a whole neighborhood and it has some good properties, which I will list here. Uh, uh, Ricci flow is its gradient flow. So it's a very natural uh, functional. It's, um, it's really the extension we believe of uh, Perman's functional, but in this non-compact non setting. And in particular, we'll have the, the lambda functional will also increase along Ricci flow. The only critical points are Ricci flat ALE metrics. So we detect Ricci flat metrics this time. It has the right invariances. It's a geometric functional. It's real analytic. So it wasn't, it's not, so mass was not, is not continuous in our topology. Uh, 
has the first functional is not is not continuous in our topology, but this is real analytic. So this is uh, the difference of the two is is a very nice functional where each of them is a bad functional from the analysis point of view. Um, and moreover, the second variation uh, really have this has this uh, Lichnovich Laplacian uh, in its uh, first term. So you see the link with stability will be clear. Uh, I will make it more clear in the next slide. But there will be links with uh, stability just after. So okay, so we take the same definition as in the compact case. We talk about lambda ALE stable or unstable, dep depending on if you're a local maximizer or not. And so you will be stable if you're a local maximizer, but unstable if you're um, not a local maximizer. So just since lambda ALE increases along Ricci flow. If you are unstable, meaning that you are in this case and you have and you start somewhere where you have a larger lambda functional, you'll never go back to this lower value. So you will be dynamically unstable necessarily, because all Ricci flat metrics have uh, lambda a is zero uh, is equal to zero, but not but not uh, if they are scalar flat because there is a mass term now. So the mass term will make um, the the functional not zero. And on the other hand, we were also able to, so the, all of this is done with Alex. We, we, we also proved this other statement that is in the compact case that linear stability plus integrability implies lambda stability. And these things have been, uh, uh, um, work on all known examples because they are all uh, integrable and linearly stable. Sorry? Oh, that, so these are um, in dimension four. They are Cronheimer's gravitational instantons. So they are um, hypercalar metrics, which are uh, Ricci flat AED. And in higher dimension, they are also Ricci flat metrics with uh, spatial holonomy, and they have a, a parallel spinner, so they are stable for uh, because they have a, an algebraic structure uh, additional to the Ricci flat uh, to just the Ricci flatness. And the question is, well. Is there anything else and that would be really important to know? Yeah, Euclidean is also an example. Yeah, and Euclidean is stable. In our case, yeah. Yeah, Euclidean, yeah, everything uh, works on Euclidean space. Uh, yeah, I should, I should have said it. That's uh, right. And the Euclidean space is the only um, asymptotically Euclidean Ricci flat metric. So, um, so this time there is only one minimizer. Yeah, yeah, it's just a linear stability. So you just look at the, the Laplacian, it's just a Laplacian and, and its eigenvalues, you can uh, say that they have a sign. Mm. So, um, lambda ALE is increases along Ricci flow. I, I don't know, I can't remember if you said this already, but the, the lambda zero also does when it's defined. When it's defined, yep, that's right, yep. But mass stays constant, that will be also something okay. I, I, will, I will say, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, it's also linked to some local positive mass theorems because lambda ALE stability implies a local positive mass theorem. Um, this is just rewriting the definitions. It's quite simple. If you are lambda stable, then for nearby metrics, you satisfy this inequality. But if you rewrite what lambda ALE is, then it's this difference here. Since you have non-negative scalar curvature, you have this one inequality here. Uh, and the only case of equality is Ricci flat metrics. Uh, so mass will be zero for Ricci flat metrics, that's known, uh, and that's the only case, uh, which was also known. Uh, which, no, which was not known. Uh, actually, that's not true in general. So recall that this is not um, an empty statement. Well, in the asymptotically Euclidean setting, it's just a consequence of positive mass, but in the ALE setting, there are counterexamples to positive mass theorems. Um, so Lebrun has a scalar flat metrics with negative uh, mass, and Feldman, Inman, and Knopf has, have metrics with positive scalar curvature and mass zero. Okay, wait, so yep. I don't understand what happens in the inequalities that you have when the, when the, when the GRF is the, is the examples from below. So, um, well, there are just, there are, there are not, Ricci flat, so I can't even talk about the, the stability of these metrics. They are just very far away from a Ricci flat metric if you want, so you can't. Uh, so this is a local statement here. 
Uh, we can, and we can't say more at this stage. We, we will have statements which are global, but only on the, the spin assumption later. Um, okay, so some. So, wait, so yeah. mass. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. okay. Um, so, I want to say also that this time maybe uh, another better behavior than mass in, 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 comp in comparing metrics is that lambda ALE, if you are in one of these uh, neighborhoods, be careful, you need to be in one, in one of these neighborhoods, then you will be able to measure lambda ALE by uh, this. Uh, L2 norm of the gradient of the difference of the two metrics. So it really tells you how far you are from Euclidean space, if, if you, that's your Ricci flat metric, or from another uh, Ricci flat AE metric. And more interestingly, for the stability question, you have a Weyasiewicz inequality, but a weighted one. So you need a weight uh, to have a Weyasiewicz inequality with the, the optimal exponent, which happens when you're in the integrable case. Uh, if you want to have a slide at the very end, about this uh, in just a uh, heat equation for Euclidean space. Uh, you, you, I mean, that's something you can ask your undergrad students to do. It's, uh, it's very simple, but you need this weight. Otherwise, this inequality is false, at least with theta equals one. Even on Euclidean space, just take your uh, heat kernel, that's a counterexample for heat equation. Um, and so we have some quantitative control of the metric or our lambda ALE through uh, just uh, this uh, lambda ALE instead of, uh, that's something you cannot hope with uh, mass, for instance. So with Alix, we have a general scheme of proof of such inequalities in the non-compact setting, and typically you will always have a weight like this. And in the next paper, we have uh, another scheme of proof, which is saying that whenever you have a good enough OSU inequality, then you will have dynamical stability. And so we prove it in dimension higher than five uh, because we have technical problems in dimension four and three, that's unfortunate. Yes. Sorry, can you repeat? No, so this one, yeah, that's the problem. So here we need an unweighted one, and, um, and this implies an unweighted one, but only in dimension higher than five. There is, I mean, there is, I mean, we, the way we do it, at least, it only works in dimension at least five. Hopefully it works in a dimension, in lower dimension, but we cannot do it. So yeah, I don't, it's not a very clean result, so I don't really, uh, I think the schema proof is, is important, but the result itself is um, a cluster because we don't have this dimension four we were looking for. Uh, but yeah, it comes from understanding the heat kernel on these uh, non compact settings. Uh, sorry, this one here? Yeah, because you have an implication to, oh. to different things. So. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so the linear stability will tell you if you are stable or unstable. You're right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, okay, and so yeah, that's the statement in dimension five. We can only do it in dimension five. And one of the reasons is this case that we cannot have a true Weyasiewicz inequality, but only a weighted one in dimension four and three. So if you want to, to, to talk about stability of Ricci flat uh, ALE metrics for the known examples with the parallel spinner, you should, lose, you sh you should instead you use uh, kronke petersens result, which is stronger than ours, but only deals with stability and um, uh, having a parallel spinner. Our case doesn't see any spin geometry. Um, so they have a, a stability in some, um, um, Sobolev spaces, weighted Sobolev spaces, so they can say that if they are close to Euclidean, um, close to a Ricci flat metric with a parallel spinner in this, in some weighted Sobolev space, then, then they have stability in another Sobolev space and they have controls on how fast you converge to it. So it's, it's a very nice paper. But they strongly use the fact that they have a parallel spinner and what it implies for the Chinovich Laplacian. Okay, maybe some stupid remark now that if you, if you have a scalar flat metric, then mass is equal to our lambda A metric. That's, and, and so all of the controls we proved are inherited by the mass now. So you have controls of mass by all of these things. I, I don't know if this was known probably, uh, but that's just a, a stupid remark we, we have. Uh, so you have 
will have control of mass by just which character you will have control of mass by uh, at least in, in, in neighborhoods of Euclidean space or, uh, or a rich flat metric you will have uh, controls of mass for uh, of this type um, yeah right that's just a, an additional remark but okay so let me so we have this lambda a um, functional I want to to link it to to um, weighted manifolds and mass so I want to take a first point of view, which is that of the link between Hilbert Einstein functional and ADM mass. And the thing is that, so that's my convention for Hilbert Einstein functional, the integral of scalar curvature. I don't want to add any constant. I'm sorry, I won't have constants in front of my mass. Uh, but it's, it's a nice functional, and this is the one that really uh, leads to Einstein's equations because its critical points satisfy this is equal to zero. They are Ricci flat. So that's um, the Hilbert Einstein functional on the compact manifold, and that just works uh, perfectly. The critical points are Einstein. But if you're on a manifold with boundary, it's not the case anymore. You will have the first term, but you will also have some boundary term. So it leads to a, a bad variational property of this um, function, but that's uh, all you can say. You need to have this boundary term. And we've already seen it. I mean, that's, that's the, the, integ the integrand of it is, is really mass. And, and so that's exactly, I mean, the way you, you find it is really the same way that um, Anna Chiara told us about the, the, the way mass appeared as a, um, as a flux at infinity of uh, the, the scalar curvature in the interior. And so that's how you define ADM mass. So I'm sorry, I won't add the dimensional constant. It just makes the formulas much nicer. Uh, so just multiply this by your, uh, your C of N and, and your, your, you have your usual definition. Um, and it is a necessary boundary counter term to preserve the fact that the only critical points are Einstein, Ricci flat in the, in the ALE case. And so that's how we want to first see mass, and we'll see what happens in the weighted setting. Uh, maybe some remark, which, which was actually our motivation with Alex to subtract mass, is that Hilbert Einstein minus mass. So Hilbert Einstein is not defined, mass is not defined everywhere, but the difference is always defined. It's real analytic, it's a very nice functional. And again, if you are scalar flat, you, your mass inherits all of the good properties. Um, I don't know if, if this is one of the reasons why everyone uh, starts uh, the positive mass arguments by uh, conformally changing the metric to scalar flat, but that's a, a good motivation, at least. And, uh, but the problem, at least, one of the difficulties that conformally changing the metric to scalar flat may drastically change the geometry. And our intuition and, and, and goal is to, instead of conformally changing the metric, we will add a density on our metric, which will make it weighted scalar flat. And we'll have all of the good properties, but in the weighted setting. And it will be linked to behavior for Ricci flow, to a good behavior for Ricci flow. So let me go to this weighted setting and make it more clear, hopefully. So Perelman's functional is a weighted Hilbert Einstein functional. So if you've never seen it, well, Perelman's have functional is really this integral here. It's the integral of the weighted scalar curvature against the weighted measure. And the minimizers, lambda, are the infimum of, um, of the F functional N. So I didn't say on what. So if you're on the compact manifold, that would be on uh, L2. Uh, on uh, the integral of e to the minus f dv is equal to one. If you're in the ALE setting, you want to take f going to zero at infinity. But, that, but you can take an infimum over something and it will give you some functional and hopefully it can be useful for real flow. But you can play the same game as for the Hilbert Einstein functional and linearize at a given metric. And you obtain the same kind of term, this uh, Einstein tensor, uh, the weighted one, so re weighted Ricci curvature, weighted scalar curvature appear. That's the first hint that weighted scalar curvature is also the right one. Uh, it's also a divergence free this tensor here, so it has all of the usual properties. But in the boundary term, you have two differences. The first one is that you use some weighted div divergence, and you have this additional term here. Okay, so what should be a weighted mass in this context? So let's work in the case when uh, we have zero weighted scalar curvature. We can always ensure it 
um, under usual assumptions that scalar curvature is non-negative, for instance, and we can even do it with uh, a function decaying at infinity. Then if you, if you look at it closely, the right boundary counter term to have the same behavior as for Hilbert Einstein functional is actually this uh, lambda AED functional. So this, this leads to this uh, weird definition that weighted mass should be this lambda AED functional at least when scalar curvature is zero. And so this should be the usual mass plus some, some integral, this one here. And the way you, you prove it is really by looking at this uh, difference and, and differentiate it. And, and, and that's, you, that's what you get, really. I, I try to motivate it by another point of view, but that's the first way to define mass if you want and the weighted mass in this context becomes this, uh, this formula. And that's surprising because remember lambda Ailey was, was coming from a variational principle on the whole manifold. It was, it's not a boundary term, but it's also equal to a boundary term by some uh, integration by parts. And it turns out to be the right boundary counter term, surprisingly. And there is also a an intriguing relationship that uh, weighted positive mass is equivalent this time to lambda AD stability because they are just equal positive, the, the weighted mass and the lambda AD they are uh, equal up to a sign. Okay, so. Sorry. Yep. Can you go back a couple of slides? Uh, mm -hmm. This one? Or? Yeah, so the weighted mass comes on F. Yep, there is a term with F here, but that's the only dependence on F. But in the next slide, there's no F. There's no, there's no, there's no F in the definition. Oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, because here I always take F satisfying these two things. Oh, sorry. So that's my first definition of weighted mass. There will be one for general densities just okay. after. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, uh, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, that's weighted positive mass for this one uh, density. You're right. I should have said it uh, that way. You're, you're right. That's a good, that's a good point. Uh, or minus tau. Yeah, yeah, it will not be zero, just like mass it decays the same way as the metric decay. So it will be, yeah, it really looks like uh, what happens for mass. Uh, if you integrate a, a Laplacian, uh, you should find this term as well. Okay, uh, so we have this uh, relationship and uh, yeah, just give you some of the correspondence between unweighted uh, objects and the weighted ones. So the measure changes that way. Ricci curvature gives a uh, back primary Ricci curvature. The scalar curvature becomes Perelman's uh, curvature. The Hilbert Einstein functional becomes Perelman's functional. Uh, we have the weighted Einstein tensor, weighted divergence, weighted uh, Bianchi equality. And if you want, the Einstein uh, equation becomes the Slitton equation for a uh, Ricci flow. Okay. So, well, now, with, um, so that's something we, we noticed with uh, Julius, and, and we wanted to, you know, that's a first hint towards a, a weighted mass, but we thought, well, that's maybe not enough to motivate a definition, so let's try to go further. And so Julius is really interested in spin geometry, so the natural thing is to look at Witten's formula, and that's what we did. Uh, but let's, let me have one slide on spin manifolds to, to fix the notation. So a spin manifold uh, is equipped with a spin bundle. My notation will be this. And it's a widespread topological property. It's satisfied by every three manifold. And in dimension four, there is a, a, clear, uh, a clear way to, to know when, when it will be the case or not. So my notation for Clifford multiplication is just this uh, central dot. And, my, uh, and the, the convention for the Dirac operator is this one. OK, so spin geometry has been uh, very successful. Uh, in geometry, in, uh, in physics, um, and some of the results are here. We've heard about uh, a few of them already, uh, these two mostly, uh, but the other ones are uh, very important in topology as well. Um, and all of these come from uh, spin geometry. So um, a weighted one could be uh, useful because it could be linked to Ricci flow, and that's really what we want to understand uh, is how spin geometry evolves along uh, Ricci flow. And it turns out that it seems, like at least, that the weighted case is the weighted um, spin geometry seems to be more natural than the unweighted one. But let me uh, give you some nice formulas, which I will then um, 
given the weighted case and everything uh, turns out to work very well together and that for me really motivates this weighted um, uh, scalar curvature of Perelman. So the first one is the uh, Lichnovich formula, we've already heard about it and some well-known inequalities, Friedrich's inequality, uh, which bounds, so that's not Perelman's lambda, that's the first eigenvalue of the Dirac operator and it's bounded below by some, uh, some um, the minimum of the uh, scalar curvature and so in particular in both of these if you have positive scalar curvature you cannot have a kernel for your Dirac operator and that's, abstract, that's an abstraction to positive scalar curvature that you directly see from a topological um, quantity which is the A hat genus of the manifold. Uh, the A hat genus if it's not zero uh, tells you that uh, the Dirac operator has a kernel and so this inequality can only happen with, when there is some negative scalar curvature somewhere. Um, okay, let's, go, let's talk about Witten's formula. So Witten has a very nice formula. It's a gorgeous formula for ADM mass. Uh, so you start with an asymptotically Euclidean metric with our de usual decay assumptions. You take a harmonic spinner, which is asymptotic to some constant spinner with norm one. Then mass is equal to this very simple in in integral. Ah, not so simple, but it's, in it's equal to this integral. And it's uh, such a clean formula. It's, uh, you see, a global quantity equal to a boundary quantity. That's a, a very, very nice feature. And if you go back to Hasselhoff's definition, which you can write that way, uh, then you obtain some, directly some inequality because you can take the norm of a spinner as a test function in there. And by just a Cato inequality, you obtain this inequality here. And so you obtain that on the spin manifold, Lambda ALE is always negative, uh, except at Ricci flat metrics with special holonomy and a parallel spinner. So that's a very, very strong result. Lambda ALE is not just a, a local maximizer, it's a global maximizer. If you take any metric which is ALE on the spin manifold, it will have negative Lambda ALE functional, and the only zeros are, um, are hypercalar in dimension four and have a special holonomy in higher dimension. So that's a very strong characterization you can uh, completely characterize uh, the zeros of lambda ALE on a spin manifold by uh, special holonomy. And we'll see it again with uh, our um, Witten's formula. So yeah, let's go to the weighted setting. So in the weighted setting, you want to define uh, the weighted Dirac operator to start with. So our definition is that one. You can see it from different point of views. It's the Dirac operator associated to a different connection, but it's also uh, and for us, that's the most useful uh, formula. It's unitarily equivalent to the usual Dirac operator. It's very useful. It tell, uh, so it tells you that if you have a, a harmonic spinner in the weighted sense, you also have one in the non-weighted case and, and, and vice versa. So that's really very useful. So you, you know that if there is a, um, um, a Witten spinner in the weighted case, there is an unweighted one. And I don't think it was always, always known, for instance. And everything extends very well. Uh, the Lichnovich formula, just the same formula with Perman's um, scalar curvature, Friedrich's inequality as well. But now you can use your unitarily equivalent. So this time your lower bound is not a lower bound only on the weighted Dirac operator, but also on the actual Dirac operator. So you, you obtain a lower bound on the first eigenvalue of the Dirac operator by something which is a weighted quantity. Um, and if you take a min uh, and if you're at a minimizer of f, then you have this uh, bound from Perelman's lambda and sorry another lambda, which is the eigenvalue of the Dirac operator. Uh, so I should note uh, it's a bit hidden here. here is sorry. Is uh, here, this is any function, and here I take it equal to the minimizer of lambda. Yeah. Yeah, always. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least if you if you take the minimizer, this will always be strictly larger than. So you can have some negative scalar curvature somewhere, and lambda can be very positive still. So that's a strictly be better inequality, but it's not as good as a, an older inequality of Hijazi in '91. But his inequality is not linked to Ricci flow, so we are still happy with ours uh, <laughs> because it's, it's it's just going. This inequality improves along Ricci flow. His inequality doesn't. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so we have now, let me give you um, 
the general definition of weighted mass, so weighted mass with a uh, weight f in C2 alpha tau, so decaying at infinity, is this uh, formula. So you have the, the usual mass and you have this additional boundary term. And our second justification for the same formula as before is that we also have Witten's formula in the weighted case and it holds uh, everything has to be weighted, so you need to take a weighted harmonic spinner and you need to take the weighted scalar curvature and the weighted volume form, but everything extends and it works uh, well. You, you just have uh, that mass is equal to this, uh, to this object here. And this directly, just as in the unweighted case, implies some uh, weighted positive mass theorem, um, just because, well, if this is a uh, non-negative, um, yeah, in usual, uh, yeah, we, we can prove uh, the existence of a, of a spinner satisfying this, and we can prove that uh, this is always non-negative whenever the weighted scalar curvature is non-negative. And the equality in the asymptotically Euclidean case is a Euclidean metric only, and in the, in the ALE case, it will be at uh, special holonomy metrics. Okay. So maybe one, there is also an intriguing uh, equality that we have when we take the weighted scalar curvature to be zero. We have equality between three things now through uh, our, so we have equality between the weighted mass, lambda AED, and some directly energy, spinorial directly energy, which is this one here, just be, below, uh, through Witten's formula. We just used Witten's formula to obtain this one, but we, have equality between three objects which are very different nature. This is a boundary term, this is a minimization on a, on a function on the whole manifold, and this is uh, an, uh, an energy of a, I mean, this would be a minimization on the whole manifold once you fix uh, F. Uh, so, and all of these things are equal. And this is interesting to us also because this is, this seems to be, I mean, this is almost the same. This is the weighted version of, um, a spinorial energy introduced by Aman, Weiss, and Witt, um, where they, ta they take the same functional but unweighted and they uh, study its uh, uh, variational properties and, and they introduce a spinorial flow that follows, uh, that's its gradient flow. In our case, the gradient flow is Ricci flow, which is, uh, depending on what you want to do, is at least uh, for us, it's, it's quite attractive formula that uh, the gradient flow of all of our functionals is Ricci flow, which is already studied uh, a lot. Um, okay, so I won't uh, go through everything here, but we also, uh, in an upcoming paper, um, we, we have another functional, I, I denote it to you here, um, which, is, which takes three arguments, a metric, a density, and a spinner, and it gives you this one integral here, and it recovers in different limits a lot of known metrics, uh, uh, known uh, functionals. So in, in one of them, it gets mass minus Hilbert Einstein functional, the way it behaves one. Uh, in the weighted case, it gets uh, mass minus uh, Perman's functional. Um, when you have um, the, yeah, when you have zero scalar curvature, it's just mass, which is well behaved in that case. And, um, and if you are at a minimizer in F, you obtain this. Uh, previous, inequ previous equality. And what's maybe interesting here, and, and at, in other places also, is that this should extend to other asymptotics. We just used it in the AED setting, but I know that some people are working to extend these things in the asymptotically hyperbolic setting, but maybe, you know, what about the AF setting, AF, or others? That would be uh, very interesting to, to look at these for f functionals in these settings. And this has a, a very nice uh, variational property in that it only has uh, one critical point in F and C, and they justify our previous uh, assumptions that we take a harmonic spinner, weighted harmonic spinner, and a zero weighted scalar curvature. This is justified by this is the only critical point, and it turns out to be a min max uh, critical point. So the min max of our functional over C and F gives you uh, our three uh, nice quantities. And if you do a, a max max mean over metric density and spinner, you obtain always zero. And the equality is always at a, a Ricci flat metric with special holonomy. So that's also one way to detect special holonomy. 
Um, okay, so here I want to <laughs> I want to tell you that math is bad and our functional is great. Um, yeah, so that <laughs> so don't don't believe that. But that's I just want to say that at least from an analytic point of view, flow point of view, uh, we like our functional better uh, than all of these. So the Hilbert Einstein functional, Hasselhoff's functional, and mass. Uh, they are only defined when scalar curvature is L1, and that's a bad condition if you want to do anything that uses uh, Fred Holm properties of your function of the linearization of your functional. Uh, however, when scalar curvature is zero, everything is fine, and all of these functionals work well. This is zero. This is zero. So well, but mass is also nice in this context, and that's uh, that's a relief. Um, another bad thing, which can be good in some settings, is that mass is constant along Ricci flow, so it doesn't detect any improvement in the geometry, and that's a striking um, way to see that mass will never control how far you are to Euclidean space, because here Yuli proved that if you start a Ricci flow, which, is, which doesn't have singularities at any metric with non-negative scalar curvature and asymptotically Euclidean, it converges to Euclidean space, but mass never sees it. The mass is going to be constant along the flow, and you're still converging to Euclidean space. Yes. Yeah, so you need this scalar curvature to be integrable to have good. I mean, to just make sense, even of these um, definitions, but the what? Sorry, which one? Which one? The integral R minus M. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I mean, physically, it's exactly what you said. It's the bound condition. Yeah. But right. It hasn't. Okay, I'm sorry. So, yeah. Uh, what's the name? <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where it comes from. So that's the way you you obtain these. Uh, Einstein matrix as critical points. I didn't know the name, but that's, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the, the thing you well, need to add. I guess a minor follow up is, um, yeah. so lambda zero minus M is your lambda, which you study in this thing. Yeah. And integral in the Einstein Hilbert minus M is a stretch title lambda, which is useful. Yeah, so that would be the what way. What about the difference between lambda zero and Einstein Hilbert? Is that interesting? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that, that's also well defined. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think that would make sense. Uh, yeah, I don't know. yeah, I don't know. That could be, that would be interesting. Uh, but the thing is that this one is badly behaved along Ricci flow. So, I mean, if, if you care about Ricci flow, you don't want to have terms like this. But in other settings, I mean, that could be, yeah, an interesting thing to look into. I, I don't know. It will have a sign, definitely, because one is a, is a test function for parents functional. But yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good question. I don't know what would happen. Um, yeah, right. Um, and so, yeah, and so uh, what about this difference? So yeah, even in the unweighted case, that's, there is a, a nicer functional. Um, but in the weighted case, at least for um, a Ricci flow point of view, there is a, a nice uh, functional, which is uh, lambda AAD, this weighted mass. It's real analytic. Uh, it's uh, gradient flow is Ricci flow. Critical points are Ricci flat. You have some quantitative controls of uh, how far you are from a Ricci flat metric. And if you're a spin, you even have some more, um, some more equalities. And you can detect special holonomy. Um, so for instance, in dimension four, the only case of equality in any of these is uh, Kronheimer's instantons, which is quite um, attractive. And so yeah, that's why we, we care about this uh, functional and that's why we introduced it. Um, right. And so, yeah, let me finish with uh, some list of uh, the, I mean, some, I'll just remind you of these uh, formulas we've seen that the weighted Dirac operator should be this one. Uh, the square of the weighted Dirac operator gives you a distillation average formula. You also have all of the usual formulas of the commutation of Dirac and the connection. Um, you also have um, uh, the, the harmonic spinners become weighted harmonic spinners, and the formula is just this one by uh, equivalence between the uh, Dirac and weighted Dirac operator. Um, you also have the bounds on the on the, the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator that extend, and we have this definition of the weighted mass uh, that we use. And if you take RF, which I remind 
you have the definition here equals to zero, then you also have this additional equality and, and a better uh, and a better uh, variational uh, property. So, could you say how you can uh, this one, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The the thing is that you can rewrite it. Uh, so if you, uh, so I cannot erase. Uh, so you can make it linear. Yeah, exactly. It's completely linear. Uh, I just yeah, I'm just gonna write it. But if you if you introduce um, w is equal to e to the minus f divided by two, the equation becomes minus four Laplacian w plus r right is equal to zero. And you can always solve it when this operator is positive by just some lax milligram argument if you want. And so when scalar curvature positive is non-negative, you can always solve it. If you're close enough to reach a flat metric, you will have some um, um, Hardy's inequality that will do the trick. Um, so yeah, you, you can always solve it if you have one of these assumptions. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>